We're starting a new series today for the summer. It's called Forged, F-O-R-G-E-D, Forged. And I'm going to tell you how this came about. I've been writing a few books uh, for about 12 years. <laughs> and, I, and there's a couple that are on the back burner because they're just difficult. And I was praying about something and I started to get this birthed in my heart, some small books called Forged. And it's the making of, and then I'm going to take a character from Scripture, a man or a woman who God forged and shaped their lives. And so they're going to be small books. I'm going to be doing Moses and David and Absalom and different uh, characters, Paul. And so I was putting this together, uh, and I felt like the Lord said, well, let's preach this. And so I'm preaching it to you today. We're starting it. It's called Forged. And today the message is really the, like I'm teeing the ball up. And we're not going to go into it until next Sunday, but this is the setup message, because I think without this setup message, we could take the whole series and twist it a little bit in a wrong way. We could get kind of um, fleshly in our walk with God and start to try to produce something instead of just receiving from God. So today we're going to just tee the ball up and knock it down the fairway. If you don't play golf, I pray for you. All right. So today's title is Becoming All God Made You To Be. Now, the definition of forged is this, to forge a partnership, to build, construct, form, create, establish, and set up, to hammer out, to beat into shape, into fashion, to advance steadily, advance gradually, press on, push on, soldier on, march on, press forward, making progress and making headway. How many of you, that's the way you want your life to be? You want to be one that's always moving ahead. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in, 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 in a little while in the message. So God wants us to be forged into his image. And look at this scripture in Romans chapter 8, if you have your Bible. By the way, you should bring your Bible to church, because then you can know if I'm preaching something wrong. Amen? Roman, you're some, never mind. Ro, it's, I'm tired. Romans 8, 29. Uh, I can't see. There we go. Is that it? That's it. For whom he foreknew... Has God, did God foreknow you? Does he know that you were before you were going to be? Scripture teaches, yes, he does. He foreknew your life. Watch this. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, I want you to go right on over to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Just hang a, hang a right and we'll get there. Romans 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Of your what? Your mind. That you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So all of us will be forged by something. Every person in this room is being formed and forged by something. Whether it be God, whether it be the enemy, or whether it be the world. And look at the two conforms here in Scripture. One is... Be conformed, watch, pressed into the image of Christ. Do not be conformed to the world. So there's, there's two things that are wanting to form your life. One is the world and one is the Lord. And we're, we're to conform our hearts and say, Lord, just like clay, and we're going to talk about clay in a minute, not the person clay, but clay that you form with. When you were born, God had a specific task in mind for you. And if you ever asked the Lord, Lord, what were you thinking about when you made me? You should if you haven't. Father, what were you thinking about when you formed me in my mother's womb? What in the world were you planning for me? Because the world, watch this, and life and hurt and pain and trouble comes along and pushes and forms you into something God never intended you to be. God never intended you to walk around insecure. God never intended you to walk around beat up. God never intended for that thing, that problem that happened to you through your family, he never intended for that to happen, but it has marred you and it has scarred you, and now you're living, watch this, you're living out of the wounds of your life instead of living out, and I'm going to talk about it in a sec, your identity in Christ, the new identity that Jesus has given you. So we've been damaged, and the Lord wants to... To, to bring us back to wholeness again. Look at this in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. 
But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him. As the truth is in Jesus. Who is the truth in? That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful uh, lusts. So what are we supposed to put off? Old man. Watch this. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Watch this. Paul says 2,000 years ago, you need to be renewed in your mind. And science has now proven that our brains are malleable, that, that when wounds happen, it creates pathways and the way that we function and we operate out of these weird things and we wonder why we're insecure, we wonder why we have all these troubles. And Paul says, you're a new creation. You're a new creature. Put off, watch, the old man. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Paul, 2,000 years ago, before an MRI machine was ever invented, said you can renew the spirit of your mind. Years ago, they used to believe that your mind was set, and that was it. Before you're five years old, you're set, your wounds, your troubles, and that's who you're going to be. They used to say that. They don't say that anymore. Paul, isn't it cool that God knew that 2,000 years ago, that you could be renewed in the spirit of your mind? So the world wants to come and form you into its mold and forge you. And God, who is amazing and loving, wants to come and forge you, watch this, into the likeness and into the image of Jesus. How many know that uh, takes a little time? So I want, I want to catch this because this is where people can go weird. I'm not talking about earning salvation. You cannot earn salvation. Salvation is a free gift from God. God gave us his son, Jesus. It is a free gift that he would save you, that he would give his life for you. I am not, look right here, I am not talking about working to earn salvation, but the Bible says that there are works under righteousness. So when God looks at me and he looks at you, this is what he sees. He sees his son, Jesus. He sees all that God poured out on the cross through Christ over your life. Your identity is, And who you are is you are forgiven, you are whole, you are powerful, you're amazing, you look like Jesus. Here's the problem. Your wife doesn't think so. Your husband doesn't think so. Your school teacher doesn't think so. Why? Because now the process of living out your true identity and being sanctified starts. And that's that, remember last week I talked about the nickel, I mean remember that. When I said, if you're, uh, when you're praying and you get distracted and you look over and you see that shiny thing and you pick it up and you go, wow, it's a nickel, and then you don't pray anymore, you're on YouTube thinking about how nickels are made. Remember when I said that last week? And then two hours later, you've watched 27 videos. I did that this week. I, I, I made a mistake when I put it in, and I put in pickles, and now I know how to make pickles. I, I made them, it was a typing O. I know how to make pickles now. It's pretty amazing. Cucumbers, I didn't know that, but anyways. That coin... You've heard me say this before. That coin is put in heat and it is stamped with the image of a president. And when God sent his son Jesus for you, he stamped on you who you are because of who he is. He said, grace, here you are. Now you're my child. The problem is there are areas of our life that we have to be submitted and yielded to so that God can change who we are and then other people can see Jesus in us and through us. Amen? How many know sometimes that takes heat and pressure? Look at, and and these are the guys we're going to go through and I'm kind of ahead of myself, but Moses went through the desert for 40 years. Watch. Watch. If you, could, if you could walk through Moses' life in the desert, you would see little grave stones of where a little bit of him died. You see, the Bible says we're the bride of Christ. And when you, when you get married, when my wife married me, thank God, she took on my name. Bri- She's my bride. She took on Fry. And she loves it because it's much shorter than Schultz. So when she writes out, super, she loves that. Amen? So, listen. When we take on the name of Jesus, when he calls us and we we say yes to him, we're taking on his name. We become his bride. And we should function out of that relationship 
as if it's real because it is real. He's conforming us. He's forging into our lives what he wants and how he wants it to be. Now, he does it by grace and love, but sometimes it doesn't feel like it, and I'll talk about that at the, at the end of the message. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have learned him and have been taught, I just want to read it again, and have been taught by him. What does it say? Taught by him. Stop. Being taught by God is, the, is, is what God wants to do for you. We think, I just had this great conversation with this guy out in the parking lot. He was a young man. He came with several of his friends to the first service. He was in a suit. He was, he was a college kid and he was in a suit. And I met him beforehand and said, yeah, 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 you're overdressed. You're dressed better than me. And he goes, yeah, yeah. So he met me in the parking lot afterwards and he goes, hey, um, I don't remember what he called me, but he said bro or dude or something. I go, hey man, I, he goes, I just want to say something to you. I said, yeah, he goes, I cried the whole service. The whole time, worship, the, the, the preaching. He goes, I was raised Catholic and I didn't know that God actually loves me. I didn't know that he actually, watch this, he goes, that we can celebrate his death because it was actually for us to save us. My mind has, he goes, my mind has been blown. And I go, here, that's what I said to him. I said, listen, let me guarantee you something. If you come here for the next few years, you will be taught from him about who you are. We are to be taught by him. How are you taught by him? Every day, prayer and the word. I've already said that a billion times. Put on the new man, watch, which is created according to who? God. Religious flesh, religious flesh goes, I'm gonna make this work. I'm gonna become holy. I'm gonna become awesome. Look at this verse in Galatians chapter three. Galatians chapter three. By the way, this is not about earning your salvation. I'm gonna say it again and again and again. Galatians 3, verse 1. This isn't a good opener, but it gets better. Oh, foolish Galatians. How many of you know you don't want to get a letter like that? And that's the first thing they say. Oh, you're foolish Galatians. Who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law? Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because he, you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be after starting your new lives in the Spirit? Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? I'm going to just, just break this open because we all deal with this. So Jesus comes. People are getting saved in Galatia. People are getting on fire, and these guys come along, and this is what they say. Hey, true, you need Jesus, but you also need the law. You also have to obey the Sabbath. You also have to do all the laws. So it's Jesus and the law. And Paul gets wind of this man, and he goes, hold on a second. I'm going to come and correct this. And he says, guys, listen, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? How did you receive life? Was it by obeying the law? No. You received it by faith. Why then did you start out in the spirit of grace? And now are you, why are you trying to be perfected in your own strength? And look right here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. 90% of Christians, not the 90 in this room though, of the other service. <laughs> 90% of Christians spend most of their Christianity trying to earn something that God has already given to them by grace. They just spend their life in, in, in shame and guilt, and they're just like, oh, God, please, oh, please, oh, please. And they do not receive what is theirs in Christ Jesus. And 90% of believers, I'm going to say this, will never put themselves on the potter's wheel and say, God, make me what you want me to be. And I'm going to talk about Clay in, in, in just a minute, not Clay Thompson, although I think he's fantastic. When you receive Jesus, you received a new identity. Look right here. When you received Jesus, God stamped on you property of the king. You received a new identity to live out of. The problem is most of us live out of a false identity, which is the world. And Pastor Billy, we just started our discipleship program. We took our first few through it, uh, all day Thursday, eight-hour seminar, and two hours on Friday. It was fantastic. It is unreal. I cannot wait 
for this church to go through this stuff. It is life-changing. And he talked yesterday about our identity. If you do not live out of the new man, the new identity that you are in Jesus Christ, most believers spend their life living out of the old man identity. How rich am I? How powerful am I? Do people like me? They don't live out of this new identity that I belong to God and he is pleased with me and he loves me and he's lavished love on me. I am more than a conqueror. I'm on fire. I'm saved. I'm healed. They don't live in that place. They live in the other place. Yeah, they live in the other identity. And God wants to form us into his image and sometimes, as you're gonna see, Moses in the desert. David had a few issues. How many of you know David had a few problems? I eh, killed somebody and slept with a woman. Eh. Peter, God chose a fisherman, probably a profane fisherman who cussed a lot. You ever been around fishermen? I'm not talking about guys that go fish at the river every now and again. I'm talking about real fishermen that are on a boat all the time. You ever been around those guys? I was in the Navy. I was in the Navy for a very short time. I've never heard so much foul language in all my life. Every second word was the F word. It was like the word the and an I. It just, it just, it just, it was laced with swearing. And Jesus said, I'm going to choose that guy. And everybody goes, well, Lord, 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 there's better guys. There's lawyers. <laughs> well, maybe not the lawyers. <laughs> that guy's a doctor, Lord. You could choose him. Oh, I'll choose him later. I got my eye on that, Dr. Luke. How God forged Peter and Luke and John, oh, I love John. Wait till we get to John. John was the lover. He just, he just wanted to be on Jesus' chest all the time. Just, I love that guy. You know, you're just like Peter, and you're just like the rest of the guys that God chose. We sometimes read these guys in, in the Bible, and we go, wow, they were unreal. No, they weren't. They were just like me, and they were just like you. But this is what they did. They said, come, Lord, shape me, make me. I want to I serve you and do your will. Listen, we start out in the, in the spirit of grace and we stay in the spirit of grace. And I'll talk about battles uh, in just a minute. So now we're in the sanctification process that our identity becomes a reality and it has to be walked out before God instead of just, see, if, if, I've told you the story before of the lady that she couldn't read and I think it was D.L. Moody came to her house. She was very poor, very, very poor. She had served this lady for like 40 years. She was her servant and her, her servant, uh, the lady gave her a plaque before she died, like a picture. She hung it in her house. She lived in poverty for like 30 years. And D.L. Moody came to her house and read the sign. And he said, ma'am, do you know what this is? No, I can't read. I don't know what it is. I just thought it was a nice gift. It's the deed to all of her property. It's the deed to all of her wealth. You've lived in, for 30 years in poverty because you were ignorant of your place and your standing. And I don't want you and I to live ignorant of who God has called us to be and who he says that we are. I don't want to stand before God and go, you're saved, buddy, you're coming to heaven, but you wasted 50 years living in an identity that I didn't want you to live in. I have riches for you. I have a relationship for you. I have so much for you to do, but you lived in that insecure place. You lived in that fearful place. You didn't do and live out your identity. Isn't that cool? Man, I, I just, I don't want to do that. I want to talk about clay for just a minute. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1. How many of you took pottery in school? Raise your hand. Do you know why I took pottery in school? Because I thought it was going to be easy. Same reason I took photography in, in my freshman year. Failed that. Eighth grade year. What do you want to take, Rick? I want to take, I want to take uh, clay stuff. That's what I said. They said, you mean pot, uh, uh, pottery? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I go in there, and what I did is I threw the clay at friends. I threw the clay on the ceiling. I threw the clay. Do you know that that's really hard to do? I ran on the wheel. I'd get it going. It'd just be a clump of nasty clay, and I'd be like, here we go. And it'd fly off. And it, 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 and it just looked like, and now today, in today's world, I could just tell my teacher, hey, hey. That's art. <laughs> Can't judge me. See, back then, they could actually judge your work. A, B, C, D, F, you're done. Now it's like, oh, it's so pretty. What is it? <laughs> it's nothing. It's nothing. It's just a chunk of clay. Well, 
what was your inspiration? Uh, I made a mistake when I was doing it. I, from, you ever seen the canvases with the paint on them? I could be a painter. That's why I said I was in an art place with somebody one time. I was looking at this piece of art. It, this is so not good to do. Really, really nice place. Everyone's drinking wine and eating cheese. I come in, I'm like, looking at stuff. It's sad. The guy's like, oh, that's, uh, he named some guy. My five-year-old did that last week. <laughs> he puked on the floor, and that's exactly what it looked like. He goes, but don't you see the inspiration? I said, no, mm-mm. <laughs> now, some of you get that stuff, and I bless you. I ain't seeing it. I don't even know what I was talking about. <laughs> Listen, God wants to make beautiful things out of you. And I'm going to read you a scripture. The world wants to destroy the clay that you are. And, I, and I'm going to hit on that in just a second. Jeremiah 18.1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, I love this, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Can you, Lord, couldn't you just tell me right here? Nope, God wanted him to see it. Watch. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he had made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, and it seemed good to the potter to make. Verse 5, then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, uh, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the, uh, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Isaiah 64, 8 says this, but now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are the potter, and we are all the work of your hands. Good news for you today. We are all clumps. Look at your partner next to you and say, you're clumpy. <laughs> Don't say lumpy, because that doesn't work. Lumpy's bad. Clumpy, we can do. That's why I wear big shirts. You don't want to see the, clump, the, the lumps, you know what I mean? Listen. The Lord's heart, listen, hear the Lord's heart for a second. Please don't just space out. Listen to the Lord's heart about Israel. Can't I do with you what I want to do with you? Why do you keep getting off the potter's wheel? And the reason we do is because we don't trust that God's heart for us is good. So we try to do it ourselves. I remember in junior high, I never got good at it, by the way. Just look right here. Never. I failed. This one guy was, man, he could shape stuff. He was making a vase. And I walked over. Picture me. Little eighth grader. I walk over and I go, he's just going at it. And I just put my finger out. Came up behind him and I stuck my finger right on the ridge of the top. Guess what happened? It went like this. Clay everywhere. I wasn't a bad kid. I just was having fun. He didn't, he didn't think so, but I was like, oh, dude, was that for your grade? I'm sorry. Um, do you know the enemy of your soul loves to come along to you when the Lord is building and making and he likes to just go put his finger in there and get you riled up, pain, trouble, hurt, lies, and you start to look like what the potter never intended you to look like. And here's the cool thing about the potter in this story, because he's just like God. He marred it. It didn't work. So what does it say? He did it again, and he made something beautiful. When God came and sent his son Jesus, we were marred, beat up, and broken. And he said, come here. I know how to work in you. I know how to fix you. I know how to forge your life so you become something bigger and better and amazing. By the way, not for your name, but for the name of the Lord. Amen? God wants to do that in your life. Yeah, you, you, a couple people clap. He does the molding and the working in his hands, and he is trustable beyond trustable. Philippians 2.12, I'm going to close with this verse. Dear friends, you always followed my instruction when I was with you, and now that I am away, it is even more important. Here's a verse that's going to scare some of you. Work hard. Would you underline that? 
That doesn't say, but I'm saved by grace. I don't have to do nothing. Well, you don't have to do anything for salvation. God is a free gift. But we have to put effort into our walk with God. Watch this. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Not for salvation, but because you are saved, people are going to see the result of your salvation. People are going to see Jesus, and you're not working to be saved. You're working to show people Christ in you. Let, your, let, let, let people see your good works and praise who? Your Father in heaven. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. By the way, that word fear is not to be afraid. It's awe. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Who does the work? God does the work in you to do what? What pleases him. But we, as Christians, we get saved. We go, Jesus, come into our heart, and we feel good, and we're forgiven. And then as we walk through our Christian walk, all of a sudden we start to think, oh my gosh, this is on me. I've got to do all this. I've got to make myself great. I've got to be healed. I've got to make myself holy. And no, God does all that. But we just have to, watch, get up on the potter's wheel and say, Lord, I'm a mess. Make me what you want me to be. And sometimes, you guys, that isn't very fun. I'm just going to say it. He's forging in us, and it's not very fun sometimes. I was in here praying the other day, probably eh, a couple weeks ago. And I was being honest with the Lord. I said, Lord, um, by the way, did you know you can be honest with God? Did you know that? You don't have to, you don't have to try to like, Lord, I want to thank you so much for these trials. I, I love them. <laughs> yeah. He's like, no, you don't. Stop lying to me. The Bible doesn't say to thank God for trials. It says to thank God in them when you're going through them. Why? Because it's producing in you. So I was in here and I was praying. I said, Lord, I'm going to be super honest with you. I have not enjoyed the last two years of stuff in my life. And he, and he said, go on. He says, I just don't like it. I feel like it's, there's been a lot of loss. And a lot, every time I turn around, there's something going on. Anybody have stuff going on that's out of your control? You can't control? It just happens. And you're like, dang it. You try to get your life balanced and everything good, and you think you got it, and you're like, okay, everybody hold still. Nobody move, right? <laughs> Nobody move. Life is like herding cats. It just doesn't work, man. You're like, yeah, yeah. And you're like, hey, calm down. And I said to the Lord, I just, I'm going to be honest with you, I, I haven't enjoyed it very much. And it just feels like a lot of loss, and so I don't get it. You know, God is so kind and good and loving, he didn't rebuke me. He knows I'm just clumpy. So he says, well, let's talk about that. And he says, do you know, if, if you hadn't gone through these things, then I can't make you the man I want you to be in 10 years. I can't make you the man I want you to be in 20 years, in 30 years, in 40 years. 40 years, I'm gonna be 91 years old, or 90, because I'm not 51 until July 18th, so I'm still 50. <laughs> and I felt like the Lord said, sometimes I, I allow these things, and I let these things come, because they forge in you more of me if you'll stay on the potter's wheel. But if you get off the potter's wheel, by the way, most people get off the potter's wheel. And then they live, watch this, with a view of God that he is mad at them and angry at them and doesn't like them. And then they become boring, bitter, angry, with a spiritual hernia Christian. And they live their 30 years out until they die and they go see Jesus and go, wow, I didn't understand what you were doing. And the Lord said to me, I'm making in you and forging in you things and you're dying to some stuff. How many of you, did you know that the, the, the great, they've asked people, what is the greatest thing that you would want in your life? Did you know 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people said they wanted to be wealthy. Did you know that? That was the main thing. People said, I want to be wealthy. Do you know what the answer is today? Famous. People want to be known. They want their name to be great. 
And I'm going to tell you right now, we cannot serve Jesus all out and have our name be what we're after. And there's little places where the Lord says, take up your cross. Does that sound fun? No. Take up your cross and follow me. Lord, I don't like what's going on right now. I'm going to tell you right now, I do not appreciate what is going on right now. And the Lord says, what are you going to do about it? What do you mean, what am I going to do about it? Take up your cross and follow me. But I don't like what happened. That circumstance bothers me. I want to go deal with it. And the Lord says, you will be quiet and you will take up your cross and you will die a little bit more today. Uh, I don't want to do that. He goes, okay. Then you don't get to be forged into the thing I'm forging you into. You can just stop right here and just be good with like 30%. I don't know about you, but I want to be the guy that says, Lord, oh, I'm going to stay on the potter's wheel. How many of you just have a hard time being quiet sometimes? Anybody? How many of you have a hard time when something happens to you, somebody says something about you, there's a rumor about you? One of our staff members came to me today. It was really funny. I was walking in this morning at like 7.30. One of our staff members caught me in the parking lot and said, hey, there's, a, there's this rumor going on around about me. And da 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 And I said, Oh, welcome to my world. And he, I think he wanted a much more godly answer than that. I was like, well, there's a moment where God sent his son and he was crucified and died to himself and serve others. So you just get to die a little bit today. Now it's your turn. It's just your turn. But I want to go make it. I want to go. I go, boy, do I know what you're saying. Trust me, I sit in my house sometimes and just... I say stuff, but no one's there. (laughs) I write the email and never hit send. You ever done that? (laughs) Backspace, 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 backspace. All right, Lord, I'm going to send it. Why? Well, because I am righteously indignated right now. All right, Lord, he says to me, you can do it your way and you can have the fruit of it or you can do it my way. You choose. Well, uh, hang on a second. Can we talk about this for a minute? I want to make sure I know what we're talking about. What do you mean do it my way? Well, you can do it your way. You can, you can, you can lash out and you can defend yourself or you can let me defend you and I'll bring fruitfulness out of it. What do you want? <sighs> I kind of want to send it. <laughs> and there's the choice where you go like this, watch. Delete. And your flesh, watch, dies just a little bit more to yourself. Boy, we don't preach that much, do we, in the church? Die to yourself. Could you imagine me on TV? <laughs> Buy my book. Die to yourself. <laughs> no. People would be like, I'm not buying the book. How to be crucified with Jesus. Oh, wow. How to give up on your dreams and let his dreams become yours. Oh, I don't know if I want to do that. How many? I've sold 20 copies of this in 40 years. But I'll tell you what, it is the gospel. It is the gospel. Say it one more time. It is the gospel, which means good news. What are you saying, good news, yeah? Hmm. It's good news. It's good news that I die with him. Yeah, because then you become who God made you to be. It's good news that I let him, as I pray through it, decide who I'm going to marry. Yeah, because he knows you. You mean I got to let him defend me? I can't always be blabbing? For sure. You mean when I'm driving? I can't be one, one, one finger saluting people that cut me off? <laughs> Absolutely. 
Isn't it funny that when somebody, I have a friend who can't let someone pass him on the freeway. He has a weird thing about it. We'd be riding together. And I'm 65, 70 down the freeway, and all of a sudden he's looking in his mirror. I can see his eyes darting back and forth. And some guy's coming up behind us. Next thing I know, we're going 110 miles an hour. I go, dude, what are you doing? He says, well, this guy's trying to pass me. I said, well, first of all, it's the freeway. He, you go pull over, he goes around you. That's how it works. You know what that is? Straight pride. I do it. Now, I put the cruise control on, and I just let people pass me. And I have a 5.0 Mustang, and so I don't, I don't really want people to pass me. It's more fun to keep up with them. Watch this. But something in my flesh goes, and it's good for my flesh. How often do you say no to yourself? Seriously. Like ice cream. You're at the store. You know on, on Sundays, pastors want to eat junk food. Did you know that? It's a big thing. It's, a big, it's true. It's real. That's why a lot of pastors have diabetes. No joke. It's the real deal. They've done studies on it because they've, they've preached and they don't know how their performance was. And so they feel like, oh, was I good enough? Was I? We all go through. I go through it every Sunday. I go home and go, that was terrible. God, how could you use me? I'm not, you, there's got to be somebody better than me. You, can't you just, UPS, I could work at UPS. <laughs> so you go, I did it. I did it last week. I went to the store. I was like, I'm going to buy something just really just bad. And I went into the ice cream place and I was like, mmm, I don't even eat ice cream. I was like, what is that? It just, it was decadent. It, what is it, uh, uh, some kind of, what is it, babe? It's a caramel cookie, heavenly. <laughs> and I was going to reach in and grab it. And this is what I said. What am I doing? No. And people, are, there's nobody with me. So people are watching me have a moment with this ice cream. I open it, I'm grabbing it. Oh, you're delicious. No. So I went over and got Kit Kats. No, I'm just kidding. You know what I came home with? Bananas and almonds. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because sometimes it's really good to say no to your flesh. Yeah. Do it to yourself sometime. Just when you're going to buy something, you're in line, you've actually got it in your hand. No! <laughs> I'm hungry, and it shows. Isn't it good news? We're all just clumps, and God's trying to shape us into something beautiful. He just wants to make something beautiful out of you. You got to trust him that he's doing it, even when it hurts. Like, oh, you're the clay, just wee, 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 wee. you're disoriented. Oh. And it's, ah, that's, ow, ow, ow. What's your thumbs in there, Lord? Yeah, I'm trying to do something. Ow. And then he's done, and you're like, wow. I could have never made that by myself. You're amazing. And then your name is attached to his name, and he gets the glory. And you don't, but you get the prize someday. Amen? Amen.